So welcome to actually our first virtual Minds meeting. So just for anybody who's unaware what Minds is, it's, it's a European cost action. We've been going for about half, half our life now, two years and slightly a bit. The last three months have flown by for me. Um, and what we're doing, what, what a cost action does is builds networks and normally has a series of physical meetings, which hopefully we will have in the future. I won't say the near future, but the future. Um, and it will fund scientific exchange and a number of activities. And, and our cost action is about neurodevelopmental disorders. And in particular, it's about neurodevelopmental disorders that, that have a genetic basis, a strong genetic basis, and, and effectively are emerging out of copy number variants, because we have a strong genetic signal. Uh, and the basic premise of the action is, of course, the patients who carry these strongly genetically penetrant um, components of, of neurodevelopmental disorders, often with children, but they're also quite rare. And the idea of forming a bigger network is that we can not only share knowledge, but maybe share materials as we go along. So we can build a bigger cohort of patients and bigger studies. And leading from that, there's how do we build bigger cohorts? How do we agree to do the same sort of studies so that our, our data is um, standardized? And how do we share it? And, and, and we have working groups that are working in all of these areas. And so, what we thought we'd talk to talk about today is a work, some work that came out of Natalia Tellis. It came to my group on a short-term scientific mission, really to deal with one of our, uh, uh, our deliverables. And basically, we wanted to think about uh, emerging technologies and how they're used in this area, and in particular, patient iPS cells. And so we've been working towards a code of ethics, at least for ourselves as a network, but hopefully other people would think it's a good idea and, 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 and agree with our code of ethics. Um, and so we thought we'd talk about that today. And so basically this, this is our first virtual meeting. Uh, hopefully it's the first of many. And we're gonna discuss where we've got to with this code of ethics. Okay, and then I'm gonna give the floor over to Natalia, who's going to do most of the rest of the meeting, but I'm going to change the slides. Is that right, Natalia? Yeah, that's right. Great. Okay, are you ready? Uh, do I need to say anything else? We're doing that? No, that's fine. Okay, and actually, a big a big hello to Celia, who's coming in from the, the Broad, so that's great. It's good to be a transcontinental, not just transcontinental. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, and anybody else who's coming from outside? Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, so let's hope you, hope, you, hope you enjoy what we get up to. All right. Okay, Natalia, I'll, if I can. Let's see if I can. Right. This is slide number two. So we seem to be on the board. And uh, thank you, Adrian, for this opportunity to be, to be doing the first workshop, which is always going to be, if there is a disaster, it will happen on the first workshop. <laughs> Anyway, um, here we are, and we are trying this hard. And um, th as Adrian said, this came out. This idea uh, came, out, came out as one of the deliverables from Minds that he had set up initially. And I was able to do a short-term scientific mission in Cardiff, not only with him but also with Angus Clark, who is uh, a medical geneticist that I have known for a long time. And um, we, we had this idea of uh, doing a, an open-ended uh, uh, questions to various professionals that were involved in uh, iPS cells. Because when you talk to people, either they are very technological minded and they know uh, and they are not interested in anything else, but we need to think about things. And the, one thing led to another. So I ended up talking to the various people and we've uh, created a, a flow chart that uh, we'll show in a minute so that you will see how the thing evolved. And it was quite interesting um, for that time that uh, different people had different ideas, but they always had the same worry, which is what if this goes wrong and out of hand and we don't know what's going to do? Who is protecting us, the scientists? So this is what we have developed, and uh, I'm going to show you in, in uh, these couple of slides 
uh, what the main concerns were and what we have done about it to think about the, the delivery or the outcome, as Adrian said, which is a contribution for uh, assisting scientists in, um, in overcoming the ethical challenges. So in the next slide, we have uh, the issue. And the, wish, the issue is to switch from the use of human embryonic stem cells to human uh, iPS cells, uh, because it was a great technical innovation, but it also heralded a big step forward in the ethics of human cell experimentation. So we are doing a, a big leap here. And this was so important that when Shinya Yamanaka discovered these cells in 2006, he got a Nobel Prize for it. He and his team, of course, because this is all his teamwork, he got a Nobel Prize for it. So this was big. Our concern here specifically is to avoid um, uh, all the problems that can ethically arise. So we avoid, we want to avoid mistakes. Particular issue arises at the interface with patients. So this translational medicine, uh, it's very nice, but how does the patient feel about it? Especially those who are vulnerable uh, due to mental health conditions or below the age of consent. And finally, can we identify the key issues likely to be encountered and propose a code of ethics so that we can behave in a responsible way? I think the answer is yes, we may try to do it. So in the next slide, we see, we can see Adrian, no, hang on, hang on. Why can't I turn on? <laughs> I don't know why I can't slide there, sorry. <laughs> we can see our goal was. And um, the, it was interesting that when I was looking for references for the, the paper that has been uh, already written, uh, I found this editorial in Nature called How to Be Good. This was in from 2018. And um, it said that. Uh, our idea was to promote the highest standards of practice, responsibility, and ethical behavior for uh, science or cell-based research. And this editorial said that it, it, there is a great need to consideration for ethical issues, not to be additional to research practice, but then an integral and essential component. So it is, uh, true that people think about it. We have known for a long time that, uh, that it is necessary to have informed consent for projects and so on, but how to build this? What do we need specifically for iPS cells to be put in? So this is what we thought about uh, in the next slide. We found that there were two uh, basic uh, points that we needed to approach. One was the discovery part. So this is relevant to minds. We want to make our cohorts. We want uh, as scientists to discover as much as possible. But as patients, uh, they will want to understand what they can get better, how they can get better. They want to understand uh, a bit more about their conditions and the use of their cells uh, to new therapeutic uh, moves. Uh, will it directly improve patients' health? But how are uh, these patients going to cope with the information? Are they going to be happy all the time? Um, the route to getting to the point and setting up a set of principles came through a flowchart that we have built, and which is uh, shown here. So basically, the, the columns in the middle, I don't know if there is a pointer here, but you will see, oh yes. Uh, the, Adrian is pointing at the three main uh, in the middle uh, squares or rectangles. And these are the clinician or the researchers who elaborate the project. Then we have the patient recruitment and then we have the technicians doing the reprogramming. Right, this seems simple, but the first box that has the, the researchers or clinicians, or they may be both most times, they will elaborate the project, but they need to do the informed consent. 
this is not so easy because if you have done it before, you know that it has been sent back from the ethical board review once or twice. So by the third or fourth attempt to it, you know that it's going to be okay. So the ethical board review has uh, got a lot of high standards and you have to cope with these standards and you have to know about the codes that you need to nominate and I will tell a bit more about this uh, in the one or two slides later. So you need to uh, write a, a firm informed consent with a leaflet to go with it. And then it has to be approved. Now in Europe, since uh, 2018, uh, we had to put in force the General Data uh, Act because it has been approved and it had to be put in practice from 2018 onwards. Um, and all the projects that have uh, patients will have to conform with this GDPR as well. So after this has been accepted, uh, you have received yes from the ethical board and you can carry on with your project. So you have your project, it has been approved, and now you have to recruit the patients. Now we have talked uh, and we have questioned people who are, who are part of this second box, the patients recruitment and the field team. Now to recruit patients, either you are a medical doctor and you call the patients and ask them whether they want to participate in the project. And if they do, that's fine. But if you are uh, having a big project and you have enough resources, you may have what is called the field team. And this is people who, uh, particularly in uh, the United Kingdom, they have this um, possibility. There is a field team, and this is uh, made up with uh, generally uh, psychologists and also um, scientists who go to people's homes and they will ask them questions to reinforce uh, the aims of the project and to ask their permission to uh, collect the blood and then they will um, eventually give the blood. There are several um, things that I'm not going to disclose here because they are too particular, but we may have a discussion in the end. Can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, because I'm my, th there is a box saying that uh, my speaker is not working, but ah. <laughs> nobody shows signs of okay. not understanding. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have the blood now, and now we have to do something with it. And it's not um, going to be um, processed immediately. You may either uh, process it later, or you may just culture it immediately. It has to come to the lab in 30 minutes. So uh, depending to whatever your arrangement is, you are going to give the blood or the tissues, which may be um, traditionally skin or hair, or any other sample. Uh, most people use blood nowadays because they have sorted out that it is the best uh, system. And then after reprogramming, the cells are ready for use. This seems simple enough, but it's not so simple and not so quick. Anyway, the usage of these cells is the real problem because depending on what you're doing with the cells may uh, you have more or less ethical problems. If you use the cells uh, that you obtain for academic use classically, and this is our main interest in this paper, it, this is going to be all the knowledge that you get from setting up the cultures and getting the cultures better with all the enhanced factors that you can get. This will be excellent for knowledge, science and innovation. And obviously this will be reverted in publications and presentations in congresses and so on. And uh, as in this case, uh, it's going to be, we hope, uh, something on um, a new code, which will be future guidelines for uh, the uh, cost, uh, cost action knowledge nexus, which is one of the outcomes of this cost action to minds. So, uh, this is the academic classical usage of cells. For the clinical use, uh, obviously there is a great interest and either 
you can use the cells that you will eventually select as a treatment for a particular patient, so very targeted, or you can use cells as the treatment for the patient uh, to see whether the treatment will work. So the first uh, idea would be a drug discovery to see in a particular uh, disease, in a particular patient, you can use that drug and then you can replicate the idea or whether you can use in several patients with the same disease uh, a certain lineage of cells to see if that makes uh, a, a good treatment and it can become the treatment of choice. For any, um, any whatever the, 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 the final use is, they can always be stored for future use or for another project that will follow your uh, immediate project. And also, don't forget that everything can be made into money. So it can be converted to patents, it can be used for commercial use, and it can be distributed, sold to other people, to other uh, companies, to other, um, uh, you know, scientists like you who would like to do something about it. But don't forget that you have to have the consent of everyone to do this. Okay, so from this chart, we have, we have spoken with the, the people in the three main boxes, as I said, and then we have extrapolated from their answers what uh, the ethical issues we could take out from here. So the next slide uh, showed uh, very early that there were two main areas of ethical concern. One was the informed consent. We had to ensure that subjects are fully aware of the implications of their consent and how do they can encompass the possible occurrence of incidental findings. Now, these incidental findings, if you are a scientist, you know exactly what they are. These are what you find when you are doing a perfectly routine uh, treatment or procedure, and then you find something out of the box. This may be an incidental finding. Uh, obviously, if you are doing a, a clinical setup and you are uh, using a, a, an extensive search for anything, whatever you find is not exactly an incidental finding. That will be a finding, okay? So incidental finding is going to be what you were not expecting and you have to warn patients that this may happen. So all this must be put into informed consent. Um, and then the use of cells, as I said, so the top bit of this flow chart and the bottom bit. And for the use of cells, you have uh, the incorporation of unanticipated technical developments that become relevant after cell sampling as IPS cells uh, and reprogramming. Now, what we also know is that the, when you are writing up the for consent, there is no point in saying what is the technique exactly that we are going to use because this may change the your project. Let's say for years a typical PhD student. But sorry, so anyway, sorry. You, you might have to say that again because it's uh, it's uh, sorry. You 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 went very crackly. Maybe you could just finish with the put the just the okay use of cells. And so the use for the use of cells, I will say that. Um, the, it is a crucial part and you have to understand that uh, people have may have problems in understanding uh, what the incorporation of unanticipated technical developments may be used. So it may be that in a project that uh, is going on for four years, you may decide along the way that you are going to change the technique. Now, you may warn uh, the patients about this in the informed consent, but you don't need exactly to describe how the technology is going to do. And what you may say is that at the moment, this is going to be done, but at any time it will be changed and it will improve and it will be modified. Uh, would you like to be informed of that? It would be a simple way of doing it. So I hope that was better, Adrian. Thanks. So we can go to the next slide. So the first issue of the, the, the informed consent, you know, as you have already 
presumably uh, written down leaflets and uh, informed consent uh, sheets. The researchers and clinicians are presumed always to have an adequate understanding of the processes proposed by the Council of Europe's Convention of Human Rights and Biomedicine, which is generally known as the Oviedo Convention. And the World Medical Association, uh, which is the Helsinki Declaration of Biomedical Researchers Involving Human Subjects. This is what you generally see in the top of the informed consent leaflet. They will say informed consent and then in brackets and small writing. This is according to Europe's Convention of blah, blah, blah and the World Medical Association Helsinki Declaration. You may also use the World Health Organization uh, to have temp templates for these uh, informed consents because they have a dedicated section. If you go to their website uh, and if you uh, tick uh, ethics and health, uh, this includes various clinical informed consent uh, form templates. So they will have a template or a draft for clinical studies, storage and future use of unused samples, children and minors, research involving children only, which may be qualitative and clinical, and you have to think that you may need two separate forms. Do not put two things on the same bucket. Because if you want to use cells on a different project, <laughs> yes, I know that Hassel is saying something, I hope he's not trying to contradict me already, you have no, no voice no <laughs> um, i'm not contradicting anything this is nice <laughs> okay <laughs> well this can be interactive i don't need to be a parrot all the time because we are all colleagues right exactly. adrian didn't say this but i will <laughs> we are colleagues we're definitely uh, colleagues. anyway we are all mindful about this oh, yeah. anyway it, there is really the tendency of making this informed consent uh, separate if you want to do separate things. Do not think that by putting in a little square you will be safe and it will pass in the uh, ethical committee because if there is a possibility that subterraneously you are subreptitiously you are trying to do another project on the same informed consent this won't work. Um, so all these forms have two parts. One is the information sheet or the information leaflet, which may have several pages. In my experience, the Canadian forms are the most comprehensive of all. They always have at least six to eight pages, um, front and reverse, full information. They are very, very um, thoughtful about, they say, everything in the paper which has its disadvantage because it is so thorough that people just skip to the last page. Um, but it should have explanations on how to ensure confidentiality, how to adapt to any new project to that form. So we therefore strongly recommend that researchers ensure that they are aware and refer to these documents, uh, which are uh, down here, the Council of Europe, the World Medical Association and the WHO leaflets. The whole leaflets are particularly interesting, in my view. Adrian? Next slide. Next one, yep. Yeah. So, uh, simply, we may have what we call do's and don'ts. So, do you use standard questions when you are uh, addressing patients or the, the leaflets? What is the purpose of this study? This study aims to blah, 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 and you explain what it is. Why have I been chosen? Because you have certain characteristics and this is a targeted study and you have to explain why. Do I have to take part? No, you don't have to take part, but you may feel that you have been excluded if you are not offered the opportunity of participating and things like that. So I'm asking and giving the answer at the same time so that you can see the example and how it should be used commonly in all informed consent forms. Don't be too detailed, as I said before. Don't be ambiguous. Don't say, you may uh, want to know this unless you may decide not to know. Obviously, you can stop in, you may decide to know about this, full stop. It is implicit that unless you do so and so, you don't want to know. 
So make the sentences as short as possible and have this being read to somebody else who has not any project because they will get down what is really too much there. And depending on the nature of the project, of course. Do provide useful websites because this is scientific information. Otherwise, what people will do is go to Dr. Google and Google for themselves, and they will end up in Wikipedia and sites like that, which not, are not exactly faithful to the truth in the terms of science uh, as we know it. So it is important that you give them sites that they can um, consult and that they are reliable. You can uh, and you must inform them about the data protection. There is no site nowadays that you don't have to click somewhere to say, yes, I agree with the Data Protection Act. But most times you don't read about it, you just want to go on because you have no time. Please take some time to explain what this is. And another uh, way that we found out was that the people were worried about where were the cells going to be? Where are the extra cells going to be? So they know that they are going to give cells, they know these are going to be reprogrammed and that they can become uh, any other cell. They have the information for that. But the recurrent question is, but what is going to happen to the cells at the end? Yes, I know that you're going to put them in a cell bank, but what is going to happen to them? So this is a worry that has uh, been said by several of the people with whom I have talked. And one of the things to circumvent this is you can tell them that they will be placed in a cell bank and this cell bank is going to be in the university of so-and-so, for instance, and there will be someone responsible for this and this will be placed in the lab of, of such a uh, name, under such a name. So even if that person goes away or retires or something, that name will be eventually replaced by somebody else, but they will know with whom you can talk if in 10 years time you want to know what, what is happening to your cells. Has anyone else um, used your cells because you have given your consent for it? Who, how many projects have been made with them? But of course, don't forget that for any other project or any other usage, they must have a new project and a new um, configuration that the project is okay by um, an ethics committee. You may decide that you don't want to know every time they use your cells, you are in your right to do it, but you, you know for sure that for any usage of the cells that will be eventually frozen, for instance, uh, all the projects that will use them will go through uh, another ethics committee for another project. Um, so that takes us to the last point, to assure that participants will be recontacted if the cells are used for any other projects, if they so wish. If they decide, no, we don't want to be contacted all the time, this may be very interesting to you, but we don't want to be bothered with it. And so unless we uh, will give you some feedback, we are happy just to, for you to use the cells under the supervision of an ethics committee. So you have to give the people the option, but always give them the option of going back and saying, no, I don't want my cells to be used for anything else, please throw them away. So the next slide. Okay, is it, is it worth taking any questions if anybody has at this point? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, Maya and Paola have had their hands up for some time. I assume they got left up, but, uh, but speak if I've ignored you. I apologize. Okay, <laughs> questions, yes, they are welcome. I think it's a good idea because then I will be speaking about the, the ethical, um, principles and so this is a good point to stop yes i get a bit more hard i saw i saw vivi uh in the beginning but she has disappeared no i'm here <laughs> oh <good>. you're here <laughs> hi uh, vivi hi <laughs> I, I don't know if i raised my hand before but i have a question now um i'm actually in the process of writing a protocol 
-hmm. for a biobank. So that is related, but it makes it um, uh, complicated and already heard some suggestions. But for example, um, how long um, uh, is reasonable to store cells in general? Because you could keep these cells forever. Mm -hmm. um, but what is reasonable to, um, to indicate, you think? Uh, Okay, I can answer that very easily. And uh, the simple uh, answer is, if the lab that's going to do it is not certified, it should be. If it is a certified lab, it should have in its papers uh, the time for which the cells are kept anyway, for any circumstance, for any usage. Right. So in general, I will say that five years is the minimum that can, they can be uh, safely guarded. But you may decide that for projects, you will keep them for 10 years. So if in your certification, you've got this uh, as uh, one of the requirements, this is what you will say in your uh, paper uh, to submission. Okay. Is it, just to follow up on that, is it expected to have a shorter time, shall we say, 10 years? 10 years is short, really. In no, f five, years, five years is the standard. Right. Is the standard. Uh, because there is the point of, you may need to, rep to repeat the, anything that you have done that has a very spectacular uh, result, and you may need to do it again and uh, although you have done it and you trust the results, you may have um, the real need to repeat it. So you must keep the cells for some time. Yeah. And the, the standard time, as I say, is five years. For projects, it's up to you to set up your own time. But if you certify that on your certification papers, that will be okay. But you should say that in the informed consent. But in a biobank, for a biobank, yes. Yeah, so the potential could be to keep something for a hundred years, couldn't it, or longer? I mean, yes, but if you, if you, when you are setting up a bank, for instance, for clinical usage, you, for instance, those uh, gastric cards, for instance, you may decide you keep them forever, and forever, maybe one hundred years, yeah. because that is precious for epidemiology studies, right? So for projects you may decide that for each project in a particular context ah, or in a particular framing, you are going to keep them for 20 years. But you must have in the lab, uh, which m should be certified, uh, you should have that uh, open possibility, you see. So you're suggesting so, there's a distinction between a biobank, which might be a resource that lasts a long time, which would partly be its point, and a project where you would be expected to have a finite length of a project. Otherwise, if you, you are if you are setting up whatever if, else, yeah, yeah. So. If you are setting up a bank for a specific, um, for instance, uh, let's say the UK Biobank, it is very specific. It has its own regulation on its own because it is a national thing like the Guthrie card um, uh, keeping up for the whole country or for uh, yeah. two or three uh, counties or for whatever framing it is but it must be regulated in that way and this is what you have to inform the people when you are going to use the cells because one thing which is a key issue is to say how long you are going to keep the cells for which is what Vivi wants to know. I mean there's a real wants to be Sorry. She wants to be sure that she will say that she, she may say to in this project that the cells will be kept for 20 years and she wants to be assured that this is okay. Yeah, so if this is within a bank that has been specifically created for this project, you are setting up the rules. So you may uh, make this a separate issue. If you are putting these cells in a bank that has already been created, it will have its own rules if it is well done, and it will have a curator, and it will have all the necessary uh, flaws covered. 
This is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. O yeah. Obviously, this, this will be different if it is in a clinical setting. Right. So this is it would be part this biobank that, that would be in a new uh, biobank that is part of a hospital. Um, and uh, which, of course, there are already all kind of regulations in place, but they do struggle a little bit with these kind of new uh, IPSC based um, samples. And that's yes. partly why they want to have a biobank, because mm -hmm. they could then install a scientific committee who could mm -hmm. think along when there is actually first a project and maybe a follow up project who wants to reuse um, these samples. And I you already indicated before, I think in that sense, a, a scientific committee would make a lot of sense, who would almost advise, I think, an ethical committee whether um, yeah, all the consent forms, I guess, are in place to, uh, um, to uh, approve uh, um, the execution of this new project. Uh, um. mm -hmm. Well, a bit, there is always the reluctance for anything new, right? So we know about that. <laughs> the first thing that you do is say, no, we are not sure that this can be done. Hold on. And then you will start padding on the uh, same uh, things and taking time to answer back and so on. But if you have someone who is a, a curator of the bank and you have set up the things, there are international regulations for setting up uh, biobanks and so on. So this shouldn't be difficult. There is someone in Adrian's lab that knows a lot about it. So if you talk to, and I'm going to disclose her name, Emma, she will know about this because she is uh, the human tissue officer and she knows a lot about uh, this specifically in the UK. And, okay. um, you know, um, this also means that you have to have, setting up a bank is not easy. You have to track all the samples. You have to always know at any time where they are. You have to know if they are in liquid nitrogen, in which vial, in which cannula, anything you have to be so specific you really have to know what you're doing and then it has to have its own quality standards and only one or two people can have access to it and who is going to give them um, the order to do it so there is a big hierarchy here it's not just i'm going to write here i will keep them for 20 years so there are people who are experts on this and don't forget you need the curator for it if it is new okay Yes, thank you. Yeah, so next time, next time you visit Adrian, <laughs> ask where Emma's office is, and she will give you she will give you some hints on how to do this. Anyone else it's at very this good stage? Yeah. Sorry. It was a very good. Po there's a very good point that's highly relevant to what we're trying to do here, which is about how longevity, how we stick things together, and how we connect things together. So I think it's a really interesting point there. Yes, and this is, I have to say that this is a point that is many times missing in projects. Well, so, we may be moving into new territory because of IPS cells where we might want to spend time collecting them from different places, put them together, connect them together through data, which is part of one of the things we're doing in a different working group. That's right. But there was no point doing that if everybody had a, five-year time window right? no five years is ridiculous in this instance well, no well, five well, years is the minimum as i said for small projects yeah. not um sure. but it, million, but not a million that. euro project yeah. no cool all right okay. should we get on to the uh, the yes. nitty-gritty well, <laughs> you have to do the slides <laughs> so let's go now to the ethical principles that we identified here well, you know all about the Bochum and Childress principles, which I would call relevant to good ethical practice. So if you have never heard of them, you are in big trouble because this, uh, <laughs> because this ethical code uh, we would have to mention them. And in fact, this is um, one of the most uh, famous couples in uh, ethics because they have written a book many years ago, because the book is in its seventh edition now. And this book, which is called Principles of Biomedical Ethics, has been uh, from ever one of the most prominent and important works in biomedical ethics. This is uh, always um, 
specified and <laughs> seen in every first lesson on medical ethics. So uh, these two people have realized that uh, some things were so basic that they should always be in um, consideration. And that is autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. And in the next slide, we are going to say a little bit about what autonomy is and what is re why it is relevant here. Because it will empower participants who have donated their cells through respecting their self-determination. So we must realize that they must know what they are doing. Clear distinction must be made between patient-centered research or any other research. In any case, the researcher's autonomy must never take precedence or priority over respect for the autonomy and consent of participants. And this is also important. Individuals' choices must be respected and participants who are incapable of making their own choices must be protected. And we are talking about minors and we are talking about underage uh, people who are not necessarily five-year-old or toddlers, but they may be 15 and they want to be heard. And this is a problem because this uh, may create uh, ethical uh, discussions between the parents themselves and the, the physician. But we, are, we don't have time to go into this now. But uh, these people and minors, minors are not just under 18s, minors have a, a great age uh, difference and uh, according to their age, they, their opinions should be taken into account and that is the ethical um, way to go about it. Now, beneficence is, in this instance of uh, IPS cells, it, it means that we should minimize potential and unpredictable risks for using them without any benefit, particularly in new technical or medical approaches. This means you can't do everything because you have enough money. And some uh, genetic manipulations or unsafe cell differentiation for cell therapy is possible. So after uh, reprogramming your cells, you must realize that you have to uh, have some assurance that these cells are good enough to be uh, transported to the patient in this transitional medicine, if that is the case, if it is just for any other uh, use, not to the di directly to the patient, this will be less pro problematical, but you really have to assure that they are not going to contaminate, so you have to have uh, contamination issues. You have to realize that um, they cannot just be um, used without knowing if they have, if you know about, let's go back a little bit. When you are reprogramming cells, you have to culture them. When you make culture, uh, when you culture cells, you replicate them several times. As you replicate them, you are not sure that they reflect the genetic material of the first cells. So at the end of it, which is six or eight passages, you have to be assured that these are the same cells, genetically speaking, that um, are in the beginning, okay? I will say no more about this, there is no time, but you really have to be uh, sure about the safety of these cells because this may mean that you will use maleficence in the next slide but and you maleficence. Understand these two points so this is sort of basically saying that the cells reflect the individual who's donated the cells. Yes. And the same level of I guess, eth ethical propriety I guess or good practice should pertain to the cells as it should to the individual has donated them. Is, is mm -hmm. that, is yes. That, yeah. 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 So we know, we know by culture, by culturing the cells that as you replicate the cells, they may transform themselves in the passages. So one of the things, there are two articles from 2020 that refer to this safety uh, about these cells, which are actually in the references in our article. Uh, the one that is the draft, and uh, they 
they do say that you really have to be uh, sure about the levels of contamination and mycoplasm and um, other issues that may jeopardize the translational medicine usage. And also you should do a karyotype because you don't know whether there has been any chromosomal error. And you really have to be sure about this. Uh, so uh, you have to be careful. Basically, you have to think about the beneficence. Otherwise, uh, non-maleficence may occur. And this is where you also have to say in your informed consent, you have to warn patients about potential adverse e effects, such as lack of immune defenses against iPS cells, transferred back into a cell or tissue donor, or other potentially toxic effects in participants because even after having passed animal tests, it is difficult to avoid all harm. It is humanly impossible to guarantee that this will be 100% safe, okay? In contrast to many other laboratory experiments where scientists and technicians may sometimes donate small samples of blood, don't do this um, because these cells may be modified to become iPS cells and you don't know about the hazard that they can become to the donor. So what we used to do in the old days, which is we needed samples from males and females uh, so that we can see and compare for normal routine tests in a clinical setting. Please don't do this in IPS cells because it is far too dangerous. And this may uh, become heart maleficence. So the next slide is the fourth principle of Bolsham and child, Childress, and that is justice. In this sense, it means fairness towards all participants. And uh, it should foresee hazards being proportionate to the potential benefits for the participants or to the others. The adequate management of resources for commercial and non-commercial purposes must be monitored. And here, as I was saying before, you have to, in this fairness, justice in the terms of fairness, because there are many types of justice levels in, uh, in ethics, but here justice means fairness. And fairness also means that when you're choosing patients for a particular um, project, you are rejecting other possibilities. So you have to justify before yourself why you are choosing this patient and not another, okay? Fairness. Um, apart from these ethical points, we have um, identified four other principles that really must be included in the code. And the main one, as I say, because I can't say the first, because in ethics, you can never say that one ethical principle overcomes or is over the others. Everything is on the same level. There may be conflicts between uh, issues or between uh, ethical uh, principles, but there are no principles that uh, superimposes or any other. So one of the important um, other uh, ethical issues here is respect. And this should underlie all other principles directed directly linked to persons, particularly the autonomy, dignity, integrity, privacy, and vulnerability. This means that respect for all people's human rights and non-discriminatory practices for participants and their families, fellow researchers and society is fundamental when dealing with IPS cells, particularly in translation medicine. There we are, the use of cells. Respect for people also means that researchers understand that possible participants may be nervous about their participation and any mild pressure for participation would be inappropriate and unethical. The potential exists for reducing the donors or cells of tissue to mere means rather than an end in themselves. So participants should be assured about this, that they are not being reduced to mere cells, to mere agents or reagents, and that this research will provide a great opportunity to, to participate in this endeavor. It's going to be a joint project. It's going to be a team effort, and they are going to be part of the team. They are not just going to give the blood, and then in 
uh, in two years we are going to give them some feedback because they will be curious about it everybody says uh, in these interviews that patients uh, want to know and sometimes they phone saying have you heard anything about the project do you have anything else new for me so they do question um, apart from respect, we have identified another ethical principle which is important to this code, and that is responsibility. There are four types of responsibility that we can identify, and this is personal, your own and the patient's, professional, scientific and societal. To cover this front and assure the best practice in relation to IPS cells in all stages of the research, it will be necessary for all researchers to be humble. Please don't uh, assume that you are the best. You are doing what other people are also trying to do. You have to assume responsibility for mistakes and to admit the possibility of unanticipated occurrences, such as through possible difference in cell immaturity when used in humans. So please be. Uh, uh, sure that when you use the cells back to the patients, they are safe. Asking questions such as how could, how should, how might IPS cells knowledge be applied and who should decide? Who should decide to do this and that is the patient, is the doctor, is the scientist, who is the sponsor, who will decide? This will remind the research team that things may go wrong and in such a case sharing responsibility with colleagues and advisors is also recommended since research is always a team effort. If you are responsible, you are also accountable, which means that you have to say what you have collected, what you have cultured and what you have maintained and are going to use for the benefit of the patient population whether the project is funding from public or private sources and whether the scientists are obtaining any profit. It is okay to obtain profit. You just need to say, I have a conflict of interest and I am receiving a huge amount of money for uh, doing this first um, workshop that Adrian has asked me to do. <laughs> so it is okay. Any benefit. It is a, it is okay for me to receive money, but I just have to say it, okay? In this case, I don't have to say it because nobody has promised me any money. Me any but money. in the beginning, in the beginning of this talk, I might have said, uh, I have a conflict of interest to disclose and this is, I am belonging to genetics and me company, okay? So it's okay, but you just need to say it. Uh, the other, the third principle is integrity. Everybody has heard of this uh, because there is the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, which is one of the basic codes for our uh, analysis and it is applied, uh, applicable to all research in all scientific and scholarly fields. So all good research practices are based on fundamental practices of research integrity identified as reliability, honesty, respect and accountability. It is fundamental for any research and for any researcher and it is the way in which the research is conducted. It's the ethos of the research team activity so that it promotes collaboration between peers and allows faster progress in knowledge, publication, training and monitoring. Every step of the manipulation of the cell lines or the cells themselves has to be done through a standard approach, recent written procedure, without constantly changing things and improving techniques, which in this context would mean not respecting, which might mean not respecting the cell's integrity, particularly if you don't have a good experience in cell culture. So as you go along as you, and as you practice, this will help avoiding accumulation of mutations diverging from the original patient's genome. There you are, Adrian. It does change the genome while maintaining the cell's integrity and accurate, reliable information about them. So you have to test them in the beginning and in the end. These attitudes are fundamental for uh, the researchers to be uh, taken as um, accountable. 
since this makes all the difference between a good academic scholar and this will reflect on the medical and commercial impact too. Uh, finally, we have uh, transparency. So from the beginning to the end of a research project, you have to think about all the consequences and anticipate the problems that may occur in the end. So collaboration with industry and commercial firms, as I said, is okay, but it must be disclosed to avoid conflict of interest, which is the core that you have to sign in every article you submit to any respectable channel nowadays. So the source of project funding, who pays for the project, say, who pays for it? Is it public or commercial? And so on. And this will allow colleagues to have confidence in your research. Also, different values and different um, views from other colleagues may appear to conflict with others. So discussing, reviewing, reporting and communicating research must be performed in a systematically transparent, fair, full and unbiased way. So as conclusion, because we are just on the verge of time, I will say the last slide is for a um, simple uh, sentence. So IPS-based research has a very high potential to be a major contributor to the study of the genetic and or environmental influences of NDD but the state of art and research practice are very likely to evolve in the near to mid-term future. So as more people do this, more other people will start doing it. So well-constructed, comprehensive, informed consent leaflets and forms are essential for all stakeholders, both participants and scientists. Ethical principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice combined with respect, responsibility, integrity and transparency have been identified and elicited as imperative in the Code of Ethics for IPS scientists. The Code of Ethics will assist researchers to overcome the challenge, doubts and worries and performing their studies with IPS cells. We hope, this is our hope and this is the last um, of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Cool. Okay, I think we've, we've actually talked for an hour, but I think there is time for questions if people wish to ask them. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, I'm okay with time, yes. Yeah, I'm going to just that, I think. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see you. Oops, okay. Happened. I don't know if you did stop sharing. I, I can see you. I don't, know, I don't know what you can see. Sorry, right. And, I've got two screens, which is slightly odd. On the right hand top, you have um, a several coming, little coming dots. Right. These, are, these are the people. Right, sorry, okay. There's definitely somebody's hand was there, wasn't there? Oh, <laughs> 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 <Well, well>, no. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. This was a very useful talk to me. Um, when I recruit patients, they are intellectually disabled uh, adults, mm -hmm. and they would probably also be, uh, you know, possible in, in such a setting that you describe. I need to have a, a special uh, uh, form, information mm -hmm. form for them. How do you explain something so complicated to people, both minors and, and people with uh, uh, intellectual disability? Well, and how do you how do you how do you describe this in lay terms uh, to to parents, for instance? Have you tried? Well, one of the things that uh, Peter Harper, who was a specialist in genetic counseling, did was to have a big box of Lego pieces in his office, and with Lego he explained mutations, chromosome abnormalities, whatever in genetics, because. Everybody knows Lego and everybody knows that you have red uh, towers and in, suddenly there is a blue uh, piece in a red tower. That is a mistake. Uh, so uh, the first thing I would say is simple language is always the best. If you can uh, do some graphics uh, that go with a uh, simple explanation, that is the best. And as I said, minors may go from two-year-olds, uh, shall we say, who speak, to seven and a half 
year olds, 17 and a half year olds. So you have to allow them to, uh, as far as they understand, to participate and this takes time. The problem is always time. We are always running out of time. Uh, if it is written down, if it is graphically is explained and accompanied by uh, psychology, uh, one or two sessions, this may help. Because in these few things I learned in these uh, open questions um, seminars that I have done in um, uh, Cardiff, that the team that goes and speaks to the patients is the technicians who pick up the blood. Medical doctors may also go, but psychologists also always go because they are not doctors, they are not scientists, and they have a simple language, and people uh, trust them. So maybe you could recruit an interested a psychologist to work with you and uh, do a, I know, a pilot project on a single thing and see how it goes and see if you can replicate it for bigger things. It's an idea. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think, I think that the, the idea of legacy actually is quite interesting in this context, isn't it? So, as you say, we've got small projects, but we've got mm -hmm. also the idea of pooling over multiple labs, really, or multiple sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to get the balance of explaining what, not, not only what the immediate benefit, I guess, for a patient or a child or whatever, but also the idea that, it, I guess, knowledge will accumulate over time and, and it will become part yeah. of a, a sort of legacy project. So, mm -hmm. do, so yes, what we exactly. try to capture that on the consent, I guess. Is, is mm -hmm. And go and see, go and check the, the who uh, leaflets that I said, uh, yeah. that I mentioned previously, because they do have a lot of uh, forms uh, for various settings and contexts. And you may take good ideas from there and also for building up the, the leaflets. Because, the, for instance, building a, an informed consent on questions you can use the questions that they have asked and put them in your uh, information leaflet, for instance, because they will feel that they have uh, contributed to your project. This will make them feel good about it. So uh, the idea of being, uh, you know, your cells will become a part of the global population of, of cells, yeah. like that, that sort of level, and why one would like to do that. Yes. Uh, the level of Why am I contributing to the major good? Obviously, you're not going to make it scientific to the major good or the lesser good, but they, they should feel that they are contributing to something that will make them proud of participating and they, this, will, uh, this they will understand. Yeah. And most people do. Most people are happy to do that, I should think, as long mm -hmm. as they understand what, what the consequences I think that one of the more difficult things is that in almost all uh, projects, the discoveries and the things that you are going to find are not going to be a direct benefit to the patient. And this is hard. But this may be good for other patients in the future. But it's hard that what you are giving now cannot be used for putting your child uh, normal. And this is what everybody wants. This is another one of the questions that uh, people in the field said. In the end of the day, everybody wants to know, look, but is this going to make my child okay? This is what everybody wants, right? And this we can never promise. So this cannot be said, it cannot be written, and it cannot be implied because in most uh, projects. This is not true. It may be helpful to future uh, patients, but mostly it will not be used for the immediate uh, present tense. And this is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so what we thought we would try and do, in fact, 
you you we would have presented you would have presented this talk probably at the bi UNESCO Bioethics. Yes. <laughs> oh, however, <laughs> it's next year. Eh? <laughs> but, so, so we've got more time. What we thought yes. we'd try and do is is write an article, maybe not an ethics article, but maybe both, um, mm -hmm. to try and publish it in a more mainstream journal. To, to put it, I mean, it would be interesting to get people's feedback of whether such a discussion is a useful thing for our field, really, to mm -hmm. just to think about it at this level. Obviously, there are minutiae in, in, mm -hmm. in an experimental context, but the general idea we think might be quite useful to put, to put forward really in, in, into the sort of public arena. Mm -hmm. it yeah. inter would be interested in people's opinion. Yes, um, I don't know if in this, there is this chat uh, line here, but this only works for this particular talk. But if there is uh, any other way that the people who are assisting uh, to this talk will send uh, comments uh, to you or something, um, because everybody knows you, they may send feedback to you or, or something. And this may be a good idea, because I don't know if there is any platform where we can write and this will be sent to somebody. Okay. Yeah. We could try and we could try and do that on the Minds website. It might take a well, it would take me a long time, but it might take somebody else a bit less time <laughs> just to set up. Um, because I guess that would be a useful thing to do, wouldn't it? To to build yes. uh, opinion as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where we're comfortable, where we think it lies, based around this framework or about this this code. Yeah. Or you haven't mentioned this and that, and uh, this is a common problem in my place, or something like that. Because what we wanted was to have feedback from people in the field, wasn't it? That was the original idea, to have the opinion of people in the field. And uh, because the people in the field ask questions, but the, each of them is in its own corner. So whether they are the scientists, they are the clinicians, or they are... The, the people who are writing up the, the PhD thesis. So we need to know if there are other points that uh, have not been mentioned and um, this will be useful. So I think that sending, if any of uh, the present would like to send something to Adrian as a comment, that would be fun. If you have a physical <laughs> yeah, it's good. And um, Now, yeah, so that's, uh, so what I notice because um, I was, uh, I'm one of the few who's, who's using IPC technology in Amsterdam. So mm -hmm. sometimes questions come uh, to me or go via me. Uh, and I think it's a different level. So I noticed that uh, the medical ethical committee, which is now uh, two uh, big academic uh, hospitals who actually are merged together, who are mm -hmm. seeing more and more uh, project applications with IPC technology. Uh, described and they have of course a lot of background in, um, in in judging these projects on different levels but do, they do not have specific uh, expertise uh, at least yet uh, on on these kind of studies so you definitely feel that they also have their own questions um, mm -hmm. and that is different from uh, researchers um, like, how do I need to inform uh, patients? Uh, what do, do I need to say? And uh, the different aspect that you um, explained. Um, and I think also within that group of scientists, there's a big uh, diversity because uh, I also noticed that you have several um, uh, medical, um, so let's say physicians who are interested uh, in, in studying their patients and they come more from a clinical side and they now see this IPC technology coming by and they're really interested in it. So they uh, are close to the patients and, and like to take samples and collaborate together with more ba basic scientists to, to do uh, cellular studies. But you can really notice that they uh, do not have, uh, though they're researchers, but they're actually have not much knowledge uh, uh, on these kind of uh, technologies. 
Um, so also there you have different uh, questions. While they actually are really close to the patient, so quite often they are able to get samples, but they, they have no clue about what an IPC actually is. So, um, yeah, so those are so there are different questions that I see, and it is a quite a, quite a diversity also uh, among researchers and people who are on the other side who need to judge uh, these projects. Yeah, but in the old days, of course, uh, before this merge of university hospitals, there will always be two uh, ethics com committees: the medical uh, hospital committee and the research. Um, or the university um, only, or the faculty only, ethics committee. Now, for instance, I have personally belonged to several of these different committees, and also to an oncology institute, which has its own interesting items too. So all the projects in all the places are different. But what you have to realize at the end of the day is that you have to have someone who throws a stone to the pond and breaks the water and says, look, we have to start in a way that everybody understands. So we have this file and the file has got 20 squares and the squares start with authorization from the patients. Do we have them? Yes. Click. Authorization for the head of the department. Have we got it? And mostly you will understand that some of these are missing. So this is very basic. So people have this idea, oh, I have patients, I can do this. So I'm going to start collecting blood. But they forgot to ask the senior members that they are thinking about writing a project that they have not written yet. And they are collecting the samples already. So this is a basic mistake. So what you have to do in each uh, of these ethics committees is to have a file where you have the necessary documents that you need to have for each project. And if you read this through from point one to point 20, you will realize that you need to have a full project written down with your um, uh, admissions and uh, with the signatures or the, the okay from the head of the department about something that may be a good idea but has no framing for the next two years in the department. So you are not on your own. People have to realize that IPCS cells, as like any other project, either in medical setting or in a research uh, framing, is teamwork. So you need to know what are the documents that you need to do it. So go to the ethics committee and ask what are the documents that you need to present for the project to be submitted and given an okay. So this is the basic thing. And the difficulty nowadays is that you, ha you have this merge. The same happened here, incidentally, in Portugal. So th there are lots of university hospitals now and the same has happened. So you have the, the hospital people that have merged with the university people. This, uh, some of these, however, uh, have found out that the best thing to do is to have seven uh, people only meeting. And they have several experts in areas that they consult whenever it's necessary. And they share the, the expertise that they had from previous works. And this is how is, this is being done at the moment. There is no other way because you don't know. And if you haven't seen what could be done in these circumstances, there is nothing you can read in books about it. So you, I understand you have this problem and no, the submission no. is. <laughs> I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. It is, and it's also not a problem that the, the hospitals uh, are merging. And, and there's a lot of expertise in those committees, so I'm not doubting that. But if you ask me what is uh, currently um, in the field, what are the questions, then I do think that at the moment, those ethical committees are searching for extra expertise from people who have more knowledge about how this field is uh, developing. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's what I notice. But I, the, I mean, the forms that we have to fill out 
uh, and the procedures are clear and um, they take all the, the necessary steps. But you mm -hmm. do feel that I think this is becoming such a big uh, area that also ethical committees are not only scientists, but also ethical committees would like to follow this field. That is just something I wanted to uh, bring up. <laughs> if you write a paper that I think there are both uh, two sides. Uh. Well, there you are, Adrian. <laughs> oh, that's good. No, no, I think it's a very, very good point. Paula, did you want to add to this? Yes, sir. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. It was just uh, something that came uh, into my mind when I was listening to the to the talk, and uh, also in line with what I think Vivi was uh, saying that maybe the paper should focus more on on dividing the two sides, so the clinical and the research. Meaning uh, that in, in the clinical part, it will be more uh, the areas that we are more aware about, and maybe maybe it's more um, so people that are doing that type of research are hospital based so they are already um, following several uh, um, genetic and ethical uh, strict rules okay uh, towards the other ones that are doing that that can come into meaning that uh, even if they are not working in, in the unknown like the IPS cells uh, they they can can come up with with uh, some kind of result or or like the other the incidental result. So, I think the paper should be should be divided into into sections uh, that could be focusing those two uh, aspects. Yeah. Okay. Just. Abhishek, did you want to? Suggestions. Add Hello, thank you so much for the great workshop. I am a PhD student at the Center of Neurodevelopment Disorders at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And I believe many of you are PIs and sharing a concern as a graduate student, many a times you're not really involved in the ethical application process for our PhD projects because usually they're advertised. And uh, I, I work with IPSCs and autism. Would it be possible to encourage PIs to be more forthcoming in talking about ethical applications with their graduate students while we're on this forum. Because I, I personally had to do things on my own to find out more about what I'm doing. It's not something that happens automatically as simply as when you get a risk assessment when you're working in the lab. Because they're more, they're more concerned about the actual work that we're doing in our project rather than the ethical implications which as, as an early career researcher, a PhD student, you, you only might think when you're writing your actual thesis. What do you, what do you think about that? Can something be done about this? <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons... <laughs> yes, okay, you go. No, you go, go, no, go and tell me. Yeah, I... Well, I was going to say that that's one of the reasons why an ethics code for uh, IPS cell scientists is necessary because you are uh, an IPS cell researcher and you don't know about it. Now, as a PhD student, you are only doing your project because somebody else has written it down and it has been approved. So it is normal that you don't know about this because you are not involved in it. This doesn't mean that if you want to know, you won't uh, look for the knowledge uh, about this, right? So as you go on, you will um, step on these problems and these uh, doubts that you will be having and the issues that are of the ethical nature will arise and you may question the PI about it. But uh, as a PhD student, you shouldn't be involved with getting the, uh, the, the project uh, right. approved because that has already been done. Right. Or should have been done, right? But it does raise the point, doesn't it, about being aware of what the informed consent was, I guess, but mm -hmm. not necessarily in the signed document and whatever else, but you do need to be aware. I guess you need the code, or a code, to understand what it means, but also I'm sure you'd like the reassurance to know this is how it relates to the particular population of cells, or cell line, I guess right. it would be. So, so, so actually, that raises the question of what is what's ethical. To, what what information is ethical to release and should be generally known by all the people involved in a project, and what is you know, 
if you like, is more personal, more private, and would be more restricted. Thank you. That's that's a nice way to put it. Because how do we access this information? We can approach our PIs and talk to them, definitely. But then everyone is pretty busy <laughs> with a lot of things, and it might, yeah, it might not always be possible to go around pestering people just for this information, even though it is something that we should be aware of. There's a there's a there's a there's an underlying good point which you won't be aware of. <laughs> which is one of the things we'd like to do is to is to sort of share information and share resources okay now the way there are two ways of really doing this one is you put it all in one big central buyback well a it's not practical and b there are many other reasons why that's undesirable including patient privacy and whatever else to control so you so the other way is to have a mechanism to sh to identify people who would share with you okay and then, it, and then it becomes a sort of more one-to-one -one or small-scale transaction. But one of the things we could think about is what sort of information would be useful to transfer in, through that route? So you wouldn't want the, you know, there would be a level at which is too much. But equally, you might want to know the answers to those questions because as a PhD student or as an ECR or even as an ancient on PI like me, you know, if you were sharing and sharing cells, for instance, in this case, between sites, and you can do all the legal stuff, you can do everything else to say that you're licensed to do things, but you probably still want to know a bit about what the patient's consideration is in here. So maybe there is some work to do Bye. thinking about how you tag that information in a in a in a usable form that would do that would answer your question but also mm -hmm. enable other people to answer the same question at a, at a different site or a different time. Yeah. It's interesting. That will give uh, Yoris something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think that's a good point. Thank you. Cool. All right. If everyone feels we've, I, I actually have had a fantastic hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be an hour, but it's an hour and a half. That's okay. That's good. <laughs> but, um, if everybody feels we've exhausted the, the topic, at least for this moment. Oh, uh, this is fascinating. This could uh, be uh, hours on end because one thing leads to the other is, uh, you know, it is just fluid conversation. We should keep going. In my view. Yeah. But, but maybe since we probably have other things we have to do as well, I don't know. Yes, <laughs> yes. obviously we have other things to do, yes. Yeah, a good, good so point. Thank you. thank you, Adrian. I have to uh, thank you also for having uh, thought about this uh, workshop. And uh, although it was the first and it, it may have not been the best, it was the best so far. So. Yes. <laughs> Remember that, you've been to the, the peak already. <laughs> <laughs> there might be other peaks to come along. Okay, cool. Right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody then for the time spent uh, joining us. Um, we're going to try and run this series, well, at least in the summer into the autumn and beyond. But actually, if it's a nice format to get together on a short period of time that doesn't involve jet travel and whatever else, you know, maybe this is a way forward as well if we've got plenty of things to, to talk about. And, and so the future talks will be probably from other working groups other aspects of what we're trying to do but everyone is welcome at any time.